Welcome to the Innovation Meets Leadership podcast. Real inspiration for real innovators. If you're looking for innovation and leadership transformation, your journey starts now. Hey, everybody. We are live and I'm really excited today. From time to time, I go live to share some content from the Innovation Meets Leadership podcast. And so welcome, you're a part of our podcast today. Welcome to the Innovation Meets Leadership podcast. I'm your host, Natalie Bourne. I would love if you would help us spread the word by leaving a review wherever you listen to podcasts. And don't forget to check us out on YouTube, on Spotify, and of course on Apple Podcasts as well. Well, we are about to record our 100th episode on the Innovation Meets Leadership podcast. I cannot believe it. We're just a few episodes away. And so we are going to bring back some of our favorite guests as part of that. And I'm excited about our guest today. He's actually no stranger to our show. He helps me kick off season three of the podcast. And we are talking today to Michael F. Shine. He's the founder and president of Microfame Media. His book is so awesome. Um, we're going to take a deeper dive into it today. We've talked about it one time before, but we're going to look at it from a different angle today. It's called The Hype Handbook. It's the 12 indispensable success secrets from the world's greatest propagandists, self-promoters, cult leaders, mischief makers, and boundary breakers. Welcome to the podcast, Michael. Hey, Natalie. It's really great to be here. I had so much fun the first time. It's, it's very cool to be back. Yeah, you know, we are going to talk about a really interesting topic today um, called Secret Societies. But before we do that, I have to tell you, every time I tell somebody about your book, the reaction is the same every single time. After I read that title, they look it up on Amazon and they buy it. So it's it's just cool to see how much the title in and, in and of itself is just resonating with people. I think it's a pretty cool title. I think that it really invite some intrigue into this this world that you live in? Well, first of all, I'm honored that you're recommending it to people. I really am. Thank you. Um, and that title, yeah, it, it's funny. It seems so obvious now, but it was really hard to come up with that title. I remember my, my agent and I went back and forth a ton of times. Um, I just... We were going to call it hype. And then, you know, I, I, it's all kinds of, you know, things. And and finally, I, I think I was just laying in bed and it hit me in one of those ways and it, it really just clicked. So I'm glad that, that you say that. That's cool. Well, you know, so one of the topics in your book is about building a secret society. I mean, literally part of what you do in your book is you kind of take these concepts that people that are way outside of the box use and you flip them on their head and you say, Hey, why can't we all use these concepts? They seem to work. Um, you know, bad people use them. Why can't good people use them? And so one of those things is secret societies. So I cannot wait to get into this. I'm super um, pumped for our audience just to hear a little bit about the hype handbook. Well, yeah, I mean, to provide just a little bit of context for people who maybe hadn't heard the first episode, that word hype obviously has had negative connotations over time. And anyone who knows me or has read the book knows that I'm a big music fan. And there's one community where hype does not have a negative connotation and it's rap, it's hip hop, right? Because, yep. and, and, and so what I thought about was that if you're just sort of in the business world or came up through regular educational channels, you know, you follow the rules and, 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 and you do well. And it's very easy to sit on your high perch and say, oh, um, it's marketing, it's sales, hype is a horrible thing. But in hip hop, you know, it comes from the poorest neighborhood in the United States, the South Bronx. And people just said to themselves, we got to do whatever we have to do. But that didn't mean hurting people necessarily. What it meant was dr doing drumming up a lot of emotion and attention using very unconventional means and kind of finding pleasure in that, right? Like think of Flava Flav. He was the hype man. He was part of the group, right? So I sort of wanted to use that aesthetic. I think marketing had become very boring to me. It was about what buttons you can push on your on your marketing automation software versus that sense of color and energy that, that hype has. And so that's a long way of answering that the second chapter in the book was called Build a Secret Society. And I used the term kind of tongue in cheek. I mean, I wasn't really talking about legitimate secret societies. I was talking about the idea that 
people who are hype artists are really good at making it seem like all of their, their success comes grassroots, but actually have like string pullers underneath the surface doing a lot of the work for them. But I'm always fishing around for my next idea, whether it's the next book or the next sort of experiment to run with my company or for my clients. And just a couple months ago, I said to myself, what if I looked at real secret societies, you know, the Freemasons and um, the Skull and Bones and the Illuminati? Why do they capture our imagination so much? Mm -hmm. I started researching it. And what I found was just so fascinating and actually has some real business applications. So it, it, okay. it's been an interesting ride. Yeah. Oh, I'm definitely I'm definitely intrigued because I, I do think that um what I what I like about your book and what's so intriguing about it is you do flip a lot of these things on its head, right? The things that we would put just a negative connotation with. You you pull it out in front, you say, let's look at it from different angles. Let's dissect it. All right. So secret societies. <laughs> let's dissect away. So a lot of us have read like Dan Brown novels, right? You know, the 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 Da Vinci Code or um angels and demons and they're big on kind of this romantic vision of secret societies that they're underneath everything and they're pulling these strings with these secrets and manipulating everything it turns out that that's not really accurate right so there, there was a period of time where the freemasons were a really dominant force and we think of that and we think the illuminati and they're sinister and all this crazy stuff is going on but we actually know what went on what, what goes on behind the scenes. And we know this because for a lot of reasons, but people have leaked it out, especially the Catholic church used to, you know, torture it out of people, frankly, and, and they have it in the Vatican, what these secrets are. And what was so fascinating about it is there's all kinds of ritual, right? Like you have to promise not to reveal the secrets. It's this crazy language where you say that you'll slice your throat and tear your tongue out and you have to kneel down and get blindfolded on a checkerboard floor. And it's all this crazy <laughs> stuff. But when you actually look at the secret, the secret is something like be good to your fellow man. And they do say, man, it is, it is all now. So what does that tell us? The secret is nothing. Basically <laughs> this, the point of the secrecy is the secrecy. It's kind of like when they build a new Mormon temple, you have to be a member of, of the LDS church to go inside once it's mm -hmm. consecrated. But before that, they let people in. People will drive from like 10 states to go see what's inside of this building, right? So when you create a sense of secrecy and ritual and exclusivity, it becomes very desirable to be a member. So instead of joining just a normal networking group or a mastermind or a chamber of commerce, so much business got done. I mean, it was essentially a networking group and a drinking club, but there was so much energy. It, it was fun. It was exclusive. You felt very special to be a member. People will do anything for their fellow Freemasons, right? And and, and so mm -hmm. um, you see that to a lesser extent with fraternities and sororities, although those have become diluted by sort of the like spring break party vibe, but those right. started the same way, right? I mean, it's a fraternal organization. So uh, what I did was I always do experiments and I, and I never know if they're going to work. I know what the psychological principles are behind them, but it could fail as easily as it could succeed. And I said, why don't I, instead of starting another networking group, which I don't think the world needs, let me send out a really well-designed email that's really ritualistic and fun with its language. So I called it the mm -hmm. ludic circle, which means the magic circle in Latin. Um, and I, I use this very ritualistic language and I have a mailing list that's pretty big. And a lot of people on it are just ever, just people, right? Like just ever, but there are a few people whose names many people would recognize very high level mm -hmm. people just because of its size. And because I had a book published with a major publisher and I wrote those people and I used this very exalted language and the response was great. People really were like, oh, that would be cool, you know, et cetera. I'm so honored to be um, welcome, <laughs> welcomed in. And I'm like, you're honored, right? So um, <laughs> we had a digital meeting to start with. And I used all the ritual. I made everyone repeat things. I'm being very serious about not telling anyone what goes on there and um, not telling who's in it. And yeah, business has already gotten done. And we're going to have our first in-person you know, event soon. Um, and it's kind of taken a life of, of its own. So it's been fun. You know, it's it's funny. So my uh, my husband's in 
you know, he, he spent a, a lot of years in hospitality and entertainment industry. Okay. And what's interesting about what you're saying is he said, you know, we would have this issue where we weren't getting people into this, you know, club or into this hotel or into this whatever. And he's like, it's something interesting about roping off the area yeah, 100%. and making it look exclusive. Like you have to walk up to the rope and be welcomed in versus just walking right in. And so he's like, literally, if we were having a slow night, we would rope it off and make it look super exclusive. He's like, next thing you know, the line's wrapping around the corner with people who yeah, want to get in. So he's right. I mean, that's such is, a great example, by the way. Yeah. yeah. I mean, the question is, is it really the, like, what's the, what's the thing? What's the draw, right? For people, is it just the fact that, you know, it's exclusive or is it that they think they're going to learn something that no one else is going to know? Like, what's the draw of a secret society? I think it's a lot of things coming together in a perfect sort of combination, which is why for so many years, they were so popular, you know, in between World War Two and, and like the rise of sort of the counterculture, the hippie movement, everyone was in one of these groups. If you weren't in a really exclusive one, like the Freemasons, you'd be in the Shriners or the Elks Club, right? So they were very, very popular. And I think I think it's a couple of things. So one is exactly what you're saying. That's a great example. It's the exclusivity. We're very wired to want to um, be involved with things that not everyone has access to. I mean, gold is really just a sparkly metal. <laughs> I mean, it's a metal from the ground, but it's kind of rare. It's more rare than, I don't know, steel, I guess, or iron, you know, much more useless than iron. <laughs> and um, as a result, people have killed each other over it for years. Um, I, I don't know. I mean, there's, there's be, beanie babies. I mean, right. I mean, they would put out a limited edition and um, you see that a lot. I, I often look at the pickup artist community. I think a lot of them are despicable individuals. I really do. Yeah. But my thing is looking at people who have an understanding of, of group psychology and, and seeing how you can apply the dynamics for good. And they do. Mm -hmm. And they talk about this thing called the guppy effect, where if many women are attracted to a man, the most attractive women in the room will be attracted to him. Wow. Which doesn't make logical sense, but we all know it's true, right? <laughs> so that's one part. I think the other part is we really do like ritual. We really do like pageantry. You know, I think a lot of us have joined mastermind groups and networking groups, and they're all very useful. I've been in them. But a lot of times the vibe is very brass tacks, right? Like mm -hmm. it's, it's, I don't know, it's the, the sheet metal association, you, you know, um, mastermind group, and you meet in a boardroom or on zoom and you, you share ideas and pass leads around or whatever, or even if it's a networking group, you go to cocktails. Oh, I have to wear clothing and, and and you don't, you, 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 know, you know, you don't use people's real names. It's the same reason that we're attracted to religion to a certain extent, right? And, and there's no reason for the Catholic Church to have stained glass windows and incense and all of this. It's that ritual. It, it puts you into a state of ecstasy. I, I think that, um, you know, it's the idea of cachet, that if something is old, if something, not old, like decrepit, but classic, if it stood the <laughs> test of time, yeah. It must be valuable. It must be good. It's the reason that uh, that uh, Louis the Fourteenth desk, you know, is is valuable, right? So I use Latin. I mean, that's so ridiculous. I could have called it the magic circle, but people have associations with Latin, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, the the science uses Latin. The church uses Latin. So I think it's all of these things coming together in a perfect circle. And then I think there's just the basic idea that it's fun. I mean, we yeah. have to go to these networking things. And even though it's kind of our right, it's work. You know, we do it because we're trying to get leads. And we can yeah. talk all day long about serving and that we're trying to do things, you know, without repayment. But come on, we'd be with our families or with our friends if, if, if it wasn't for that. If you create something that people would do anyway, because it's an adventure, business gets done as a side effect. Yeah. So, so I have a question, like, let's take this into 
salesperson, right, running a sales org, software as a service, how can they apply the idea of this to their business, right? They they literally sell software for a living. How can they take this concept and port it into what they're doing today? So I'll come at it at an angle. So I know a gentleman who is a very successful really insurance salesman, you know, you wouldn't think of him as such because there are certain connotations with that. And he has, it's kind of, there's an estate planning element, but he makes his living by transacting insurance. His strategy was, so so that's a boring industry. I mean, that's the same as SaaS, if not more boring, Um, important, but, but boring. So, so um, what he did, which was so brilliant is He's part of a company called Locked In, which is a major insurance company. You know, they kind of have their individual divisions within Locked In and are paid on what they sell. But he started his own company and it's an event planning company. And he invites high net worth individuals and people in the investment industry, which is who he sells to, to attend these extremely exclusive high end events, not a secret society. But they're exclusive, they're invite only, there are high level people there, not everyone gets in, it's at a nice place. That's his company that he owns and it breaks even. He never makes a dime off of this company, but he does 90% of his business at Lockton Mm -hmm. through this company. So I think the idea is to think about, you don't have to call it a secret society, but how can you bring ritual into what you're doing? How can you bring exclusivity into what you're doing? So I don't know, let's say you're selling a SaaS software, right? Um, and, 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 and okay, earmark those people who are your best referral sources, right? The people that you would want to network with anyway, that you would normally just invite to some boardroom sort of mastermind group. And instead, um, create you know, I, I don't know, some version of like a, a membership card that's made out of metal instead of paper that you send them in the mail mm-hmm. and you say, um, you've been, you're one of, we, 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 uh, we assessed 500 people and we've only chosen 20 wow. to be part of yeah. this group that meets, um, the goal will be to transact business and to help each other out. But there will be all kinds of other things that we do. We're, we're a brotherhood, you know, or, or, or what have you. I mean, I'm making this up as I go yeah. along. But in <laughs> other words, give them things that they're not getting elsewhere. So it's funny. So you, 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 you talk about leadership, right? And I, I think you're very good at that. And what's so interesting to me is I go on LinkedIn and everyone's out there talking about leadership on LinkedIn. And God bless them. But how are they talking about leadership the same exact way that everyone else is talking about it? Isn't right. That the opposite of leadership. They're talking about service and they're talking about, you know, um, gosh, I don't know. Just, we know all the terms. I can't even think of them. Just every yeah. cliche you can possibly yes. think about yep. talking about leadership. Yep. And it's like, it's almost so easy to stand out, just create a sense of pageantry and excitement Mm -hmm. and color and fun and ritual. You only need a touch of it and you won't blend into the the woodwork like everyone else. And that's, you know what, you're leaning into something that I think is really important. That is the blending into the woodwork. I think, I think that's what happens a lot. And unfortunately I think that is why this becomes so hard because everyone is saying the same thing. Part of that is, we're just regurgitating what we hear. We're not pulling from original thought. And so I think part of it is taking the time for people to actually understand what it is that they think about a topic. And then you have to ask yourself, so what, who cares? Because sometimes what you think about the topic is what 50 other people have said, but what, what makes you stand out in that topic? What makes your position unique? Why does it matter that you're saying this and and how will it change anyone by hearing it? And I think if you can't articulate that, that may be a topic that is not worth spending your time on. I think there's something in this hype handbook as well that is like pick a side that yeah. is unique enough that people will lean in and care about what you're saying. Yeah, and I, and and I think you're a hundred percent right. And something else that that I would add to that is even if you do have a unique point of view and something new to say, 
Well, well, first of all, how do you come up with that unique point of view, right? We're not 100% creative all the time, right? And some <laughs> of us aren't very creative at all. I mean, we, we, in other words, that's why people hire people like me. We're all good at different things. You might be a fantastic financial analyst. So to ask a financial analyst to come up with creative packaging, marketing ideas or hype ideas is right. tough, right? Or content ideas. So what's one way you can generate good ideas? Look to places outside your industry. I think that's mm -hmm. the big problem. Like yeah. how many people do you know in your field who have, their reading is a big thing now, right? Everyone mm -hmm. talks about reading, but look at the books they read. Seven Habits of Highly Effective People, mm -hmm. Start With Why, Atomic Habits. I mean, <laughs> right? I mean, it's, it's, there's like 10 books. Uh -huh. and, and, and then they, Adam Grant, you know, give and take. And, and you hear the same ideas. Why not look at, read a book that you're interested in from theoretical physics or sports or music or something interesting and then apply those ideas. So it may not be original to your, to their field. I, I call it um, cultural arbitrage. It'll mm -hmm. be original to that field. So that's one thing. The other thing is packaging is everything, right? So I created a secret society just because an idea is not original doesn't mean it's not effective, right? So mm. a networking group is an effective idea. Yeah. Leadership coaching, if you're good at it, is very effective. Accounting, my accountant, mm. I have an accountant and a bookkeeper, and both of them are more than either of those things. They are pivotal to my financial survival. Mm -hmm. But they're an accountant and a bookkeeper, you know <laughs> what I mean? And and a very both very good ones. So the idea then becomes how do you package it mm -hmm. so that it stands out? So if you're talking about leadership, instead of saying, gosh, I mean, I'm, 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 I'm like at a, I'm blanking out about the terms <laughs> that people use, but you know, service-based leadership, win-win right. solutions, you know, all of this stuff, right. Come up with, do the equivalent of using Latin, you know, mm -hmm. come up with um, an interesting spin, use humor, uh, one thing we're experimenting on now that we're about to launch is I'm going to do reaction videos um, where I look at gurus who are really good at marketing, but they're a little, but they, but they tend to sell kind of garbage and I'm going to tear it apart, tear them apart and then talk about how you can repurpose their stuff for good. And I'm doing it with a guy who's a comedian. So <laughs> Where did I get that idea? One of the ways I like to waste time is I watch this show on YouTube called Frankenstein's Lab. It's basically two stoners who sit there and watch comedy clips and laugh. And it's <laughs> hilarious. And they get like hundreds of thousands of views. And I'm like, well, what if I did that in the business world? But I'm just, but it's going to be the kind of content, it's marketing content. So I think that's really important. Yeah. Well, you're leaning, you're leaning into something very interesting here. And I think it's, um, so often we just try to take what's happening in our industry and apply that across versus right. looking at other industries, understanding what the concept is, and then figuring out if, is that a unique enough concept that if I applied it in the area that I'm in, we'd actually have something, right? We'd have hype. We'd have this ability to stand out and, and exactly. look different. And I think that that is the challenge, right? In any industry, anyone is in it, especially for a marketer. How do you not sound like everyone else? How are you not just copying and pasting what everyone else is doing? How are you standing out? How are you making an impact? Why does what you have to say matter? I think those are yeah, those are things that people should wake up every day asking themselves. I agree. And I, I, I think that even if you do get past the hump of, you know, coming up with the ideas, I think where people struggle a lot too is fear that they should have. Because if you do something that's too bold, it's easy to pay lip service to saying, don't be afraid. But if you do something really bold in the internet era and it resonates the wrong way, your reputation can be destroyed, even if it's unfair, yeah. right? Yeah. So the trick is to have a very experimental mindset. Like at mm -hmm. our company, what we do is when we work with people, um, we, we create these hype gambits, as we call them, which are experiments. And a lot of the stuff we come up with is very weird and bold and unusual. But we don't go big. We don't tell them, you know, okay, spend 20 grand on ads because if it falls flat, A, you lose 20 grand. But more importantly, you can destroy your company. Mm -hmm. So, and most ideas fail, even ones that seem good, right? That, that, that I expected that, um, that uh, secret society idea to fail because most do. 
And I don't know what's going to happen with the video idea with the comedian. So the, tr the trick is to base your stuff on psychological principles that work, but even more importantly, conduct very small experiments that just give you the data you need to know if you should go bigger and kill the losers very, very quickly. Yes. Well, what you're yeah. leaning into there is an, an, it's also an innovation principle. And, and so I love that you went there because that, that is such a core to innovation, right? Yeah. Fail fast, fail cheap, fail often. It's very important. Do it small. <laughs> but the pro small. And the problem with that is people, it's funny. I, I, I love my clients, but very often I'll get clients. I have difficult conversations with some clients. So a lot of clients, my v, one sector that we work with a lot is venture funded startups and they don't have this problem. They want to take risks like yeah. crazy, which yeah. is why I love working with them. <laughs> but sometimes I'll get really talented people and companies that are in conservative industries. So frankly, executive coaches, mm -hmm. they think that they're risk takers. They're very good at what they do. And they come to you and they say, we want to just stand out and, and this and that. And then the minute that I propose something that's even a little bit wacky, they push back really hard. Mm -hmm. And the way that I've learned to get them around that, because they really can't stand out. If you stay too lowercase c conservative, yeah. Yeah. you're not going to have explosive growth. You might have mm -hmm. incremental growth. Yeah. So the way I, I learned to get around that is by really emphasizing what you're calling the innovation component. It's I'm not asking you to even post this. I'm not asking you to do a month's worth of content on LinkedIn where you're doing X, Y, Z that could really insult ABC. I'm asking you to do one article on this contrarian topic and send it to 20 people that you right. trust yeah. and see how they react. Like really small. And right. that gets them over that hump, right? It allows them to innovate. Because it all is innovation. You have, you bring up. I'm I'm really glad you brought that up because it it it's about being comfortable with innovation. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and and like you said, if you're doing it as a small experiment, that's way different than let's send that out to twenty thousand people and hopefully it works. So you can, you can kill yourself doing that on yeah. many levels. You know, <laughs> you will. Yeah. Man, you know, every time every time we talk, I feel like our time goes so fast. Um, <laughs> so. Tell people, how can they find you? How can they follow you? And how can they learn more about Microfame Media? Well, even though I often talk smack about traditional marketing, I was a traditional marketer at one time, <laughs> sort of. So one thing that traditional marketers say is have one call to action. So I'm going to give you the main call to action, and then I'll tell you the other stuff. But if you do nothing else to learn about me and, and what I do, and by extension, the company, Microfame Media, Go on to wherever you buy books, whether it's Amazon or order it at your bookstore and type in the hype hand book because, um, A, I'm really proud of the book and it gives away all my secrets and B, selfishly, most people these days who hire our company read the book and come to us because it really lays out what we do. So, um, but yeah, the company is Microfame Media. So it's microfamemedia.com. I'm michaelfshine.com, S-C-H-E-I-N.com. But yeah, um, even if you don't hire us after reading the book, a little hint, I give away everything I know. So you may as well read it. <laughs> That's awesome. Well, I love it. Thank you for joining us, Michael. This was awesome. Time always goes way too fast when uh, connecting on, on your book and just talking to you. Really enjoyed it today. Oh, me too. This was great. I really love this conversation. Thanks, Natalie. Well, to our listeners, thank you for joining the Innovation Meets Leadership podcast. And remember, don't just get out of the box. Break the box and set it on fire. Let's go transform something. Thank you for joining us for the Innovation Meets Leadership podcast. Be sure to subscribe to our show on iTunes. Follow us on Instagram or Facebook at Innovation Meets Leadership. And visit our site at innovationmeetsleadership.com for more innovation resources.